Great. Um, all right, so today I will be talking about um, a project that's uh, been in our lab for I guess about five years or so now, um, uh, looking at sodium channelopathies and uh, trying to investigate essentially the concealed nature of a uh, particular sodium channelopathy that we've been interested in um, for, for several years now. So let's kind of dive in. So we're, we're often interested in sodium channelopathies um, because these are, you know, the, one of the main triggers of cardiac arrhythmias and the dysfunctional function uh, of ion channels uh, arising due to mutations um, are, are exactly this, these triggers. Um, so the focus of the work that I'll be presenting today is looking at a specific uh, example, looking at a gain of function mutation um, in the voltage gated sodium channel or NAV 1.5 and in particular mutations that are associated with the, the gene uh, SCN5A, um, which is the gene encoding the, the alpha subunit. Uh, of the sodium channel. Um, and so in particular, we're interested in mutations that are associated with uh, the cardiac disease known as long QT syndrome and particular long QT type three. Um, and so this, this kind of illustration uh, is showing the, the map of the sodium channel uh, alpha subunit. And each of these little bubbles here is representing uh, mutations that are associated with different amino acids. Um, and just the, the main kind of point to, to illustrate here is just that there are a lot of different ways in which dysfunction of this uh, channel can lead to arrhythmias. Um, so the long QT syndrome that we'll be talking about is associated with several different types of mutations. Each of these blue um, bubbles here is essentially a different uh, mutation associated with long QT. Um, and as we'll see, that, that leads to some particular challenges with trying to understand um, how this disease manifests uh, clinically. So just to kind of give, you know, kind of the, the big picture so we're all on the same page. Um, so long QT essentially um, is a manifestation of a prolongation of the ventricular action potential duration. So I think most of us are fairly familiar with the cardiac um, electrocardiogram. Um, and we know that the, the QRS complex here generally corresponds with the timing of the um, activation of the ventricles and the T wave corresponds with the repolarization of the ventricular action potential. And so essentially uh, a prolongation of the ventricular action potential duration manifests as a prolongation of the QT interval or hence a long QT uh, syndrome. Um, and so in general, the long QT type three is uh, driven by essentially a, um, as I said, a gain of function in the sodium channel mutation, which leads to what's known as a late sodium current. So under normal conditions, I think many of us are familiar with the sodium channel having a fairly um, you know, typical function of very rapidly activating and very rapidly inactivating. And that essentially corresponds with triggering the cardiac action potential. And then throughout the duration of the action potential, we can see that there's very little sodium current um, during that plateau phase. Um, but in our mutation phenotype, we have this very prolonged and pronounced late sodium current that persists throughout the action potential. This current itself is the trigger for prolonging the action potential. And it also often drives these irregular depolarizations, um, which are known as early after depolarizations or EADs. And these themselves can be the trigger for uh, an arrhythmia. And so we're particularly interested in understanding what regulates this late sodium current um, in these uh, mutation uh, settings. So, um, you know, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that there are several different mutations that are associated with long QT3. Um, and because of that, there's actually several different molecular mechanisms that in turn can drive this late sodium current. And just to kind of illustrate two examples, we can see that this late sodium current, um, one particular way in which it can manifest is if the channel um, exhibits an impaired uh, inactivation. So here we're showing the curves as a function of voltage for the steady state activation and inactivation. And in the setting where we have impaired inactivation, we essentially can see that this is gonna lead to a sodium current at voltages that are uh, associated with the plateau phase. And that leads to this sustained sodium current um, that persists throughout the um, plateau. Uh, similarly, a different mechanism could be instead of impaired inactivation, there could be a shift in this curve 
which leads to this overlap between the um, activation and inactivation of the channel. This overlap is sometimes referred to as a window current because essentially when the voltage enters this regime, you get this current that is also this sort of um, aberrant late sodium current. And so while these are two particular mechanisms of, uh, that can lead to this late sodium current, kind of the, the key thing to take is that the, that the disorder still manifests similarly, which is this late sodium current. So the current can look a little bit different, but it's the presence of this late current that is, is the, um, typical of the long QT phenotype. And so these different molecular mechanisms can in fact have really important consequences for potential treatment. Um, and so uh, some really nice work um, recently from Juan Dijou um, at a John Silva's lab looked at some of the specific uh, kinetics associated with these mutations. And so, as I mentioned, all of the mutations sort of manifest very similarly in that they have this late sodium current, but the mutations can affect the kinetics of the channels differently. And so um, the Silva lab has this nice technique where they essentially attach a fluorophore to the voltage sensing domain of, um, of the sodium channel. And then they can look at the activation of that domain as a function of voltage. And here they're showing just that activation as a function of voltage for two different mutations and the phenotype. And I think one thing that's particularly interesting is that you can see, even though both of these mutations give you this late sodium current, is that they actually affect the activation of the voltage sensing domain differently. One causes a shift to the left, whereas yeah, um, other mutation causes a shift to a right. So it's not just sort of a, a simple um, change. Um, and what they show that's even sort of more um, consequential for a, from a therapeutic standpoint is they, they looked at um, these mutations and actually a whole class of uh, 15 different mutations that are associated with long QT3. And they characterize this um, half voltage and they find this huge range of um, um, half uh, points uh, associated with the, the um, voltage sensing domain activation. And what they found is that this um, half activation point is actually really well correlated with how much block they see when they treat these channels with a particular sodium channel um, blocker, uh, mixilatine. So on one hand, that's a really nice finding and it so shows that um, these different mutations affect the channel you know, very differently, but in a way that's correlated with how they respond to a particular therapeutic. At the same time, it says that treating these patients is potentially going to be very complicated because even though they manifest very similarly, the underlying mechanisms behind the mutations lead to very different responses to therapeutics. So that's one particularly big challenge associated with, um, with this disorder. And another particular sort of challenging aspect of this disorder that we've been interested in, in is the fact that this disease is sometimes referred to as what's known as a concealed disease. And so what, what I mean by that is that the disease, the, the symptoms of the disease itself often won't manifest in patients until fairly late in life, um, you know, into the early uh, 20s and 30s. And so um, these patients that have these mutations will often be completely asymptomatic. And that means having a, a, essentially a completely normal QT interval for many decades of life. Um, so this is one particular study that followed patients that have the long QT mutation. And they looked at groups that either had the prolonged QT interval versus a normal um, interval. Perhaps not surprisingly, patients with the prolonged QT interval had a higher risk of cardiac events or sudden cardiac death. But those that still had the QT interval in a fairly normal range still had an increased risk of, of sudden cardiac death. Um, and this increase sort of starts roughly around 10 to 20 years old. So, you know, again, a, a decade essentially into life. Um, and what's often particularly, you know, traumatic or, or difficult with this disorder um, is that sudden cardiac death is often the first symptom that these patients uh, exhibit. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I, I'll often refer to this disorder as the least common, but the most lethal. Um, and so there's actually many different classes of long QT syndromes. Um, long QT 1, 2, and 3 are essentially the most common. Of those three, long QT 3 is actually the least likely to have any cardiac event. So here showing long QT 3 relative to 1 and 2 um, in terms of there being any cardiac event but it's actually the most lethal in terms of there being an aborted cardiac event or sudden cardiac death. So it's a particularly challenging disorder from just from a clinical standpoint in that you may not know you have symptoms uh, of it, but then when you do, it's, it's often a very lethal symptom uh, to start.
So this was really our kind of motivation for, for trying to understand this disorder a bit uh, in a bit more detail. So one thing that's particularly interesting is that the, these EADs and these prolonged action potentials um, that I, you know, that we showed earlier are, are fairly reproducible events when you look at isolated myocytes um, that have these long QT associated mutations, um, but they're often much more rare in cardiac tissue. And then as, you know, I, I mentioned with, with, with patients, they're often much more rare in patients in terms of actually having um, arrhythmic events. And so at kind of just like a high level glance, you would think, well, the main difference between looking at an isolated cell versus tissue is, well, cell coupling, right? In tissue, the cells have cell-cell coupling interactions. Um, and so often kind of like a, a very easy explanation for that difference is that there's, that there are differences in tissue between this sink source difference, right? With the basic idea being that in tissue, right, you have more surrounding tissue that needs to be depolarized. And so you have this larger sink. And so the EAD is, doesn't really have enough current to depolarize that surrounding tissue. Um, but I think that explanation is a, is a little bit problematic in this setting. That's often sort of thought about in the context where you have like an ectopic beat that has to depolarize its surrounding tissue. Um, but in this setting, these mutations that produce this late sodium current are present in all of the cells, right? So in theory, all of the tissue is sort of prone to have these EADs. Um, and yet the tissue doesn't necessarily manifest with EADs, right? And so the question is, what can we, you know, what potentially explains that, that difference? And so it required thinking a little bit more closely about sodium channel signaling in general, um, and in particular, its relationship with cell-cell coupling. So now I'll give sort of a, a little brief detour to, to talk a little bit more and, and think a little bit more about cell-cell coupling and how that interacts with sodium channels. So we know that the, the site of cell-cell coupling um, is essentially facilitated at a, a structural regime in, in the cardiac cells known as the intercalated disc. Um, and so this is the region where the, the cells form their junctions. And there's essentially, we can think of there being as two main roles associated with cell-cell coupling. Um, one being the electrical coupling, right, allowing a direct electrical communication between cells, as well as mechanical coupling, right, so the transmission of mechanical forces between cells. And uh, the electrical coupling is essentially facilitated um, primarily through GAT junctions, which are electrical um, or um, ion channels that essentially directly couple between two neighboring cells. And we know that there are um, uh, adherens, junctions, and desmosomes that play kind of the key role in forming these mechanical uh, junctions. And, right. So how does this interact with uh, sodium signaling? Well, we've, we've known for maybe roughly the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years or so that um, sodium channels and NAV 1.5, the, the channel that we're interested in, in particular um, is clustered uh, preferentially um, at the intercalated disc near these gap junctions uh, and adherence junctions. And so this is some, some nice work from uh, Mario Delmar's group that looked at um, the junctions of cells and stain for NCANherin, which is one of the main um, adherence junction proteins, and NAV1.5. And we can see kind of zooming in on the, the region of the intercalated disc that there's these clusters of, of cadherins um, and sodium channels that, that form at, in these spaces. Um, some really nice work. Um, this is my, my colleague now at Ohio State, Sai um, Birara uh, Gavin. Um, this is work he did um, during his postdoc with, with Rob Gordy, um, looking at the localization of sodium channels with Connexin 43, which is one of the main gap junctional proteins. And again, they show really nice clustering of NAV 1.5 and Connexin 43 um, occurring at the intercalated disc. Um, and then some and follow-up work, um, also with Rob Cordy, Sai um, used storm microscopy to really nicely kind of quantify this relationship. Um, so th these images here are actually showing like essentially like a cross-sectional view of the uh, intercalated disc. And you can see these really nice clusters of Connexin 43 and NAV 1.5 that are essentially kind of like interwoven with each other. And uh, when they, they quantify these, they see that these essentially form um, domains that are really within, you know, 100 or so nanom um, nanometers of each other. So um, in particular with Connexin 43, NAV 1.5 is very closely associated with these junctional proteins in, in fairly small spaces. 
So that's kind of one of the key features uh, that, that we sort of now know or have a good sense of experimentally in terms of how sodium channels are interacting at the in intercalated disc. Um, and then some other really nice work that um, is also from Cy. This is during his uh, PhD work with Steve Polzing, um, who's also my collaborator on this, on this project, is that these sodium channels are actually forming clusters around gap junctions um, in fairly narrow spaces. And so this is, these are um, TEM or transmission electron microscopy images of the gap junction here. Um, and they essentially are identifying the space that's directly adjacent to the gap junction, which they call the perinexus. And so, you know, from the um, imaging from the previous slide, we, we have a pretty good sense that um, within, you know, a, a few hundred nanometers or so is that these regions are fairly densely packed um, with sodium channels. And so they've done some really nice work to actually quantify what these spaces um, actually are physically, what, what's the actual geometry. Um, and they see that these spaces are really on the order, again, in the, the nanometer um, range. Um, you know, anywhere from about 10 or so up to about 50 on kind of the, the upper end of, uh, on the upper end. Um, and what's also nice is they've started to develop a suite of tools that we can use to perturb these domains. Um, and so kind of at a, a, um, a simple first pass is they found that you can use osmotic agents, so something like mannitol, um, to, um, to um, perturb these uh, domains. So here, where they, they've added mannitol, which they are identifying as an acute interstitial edema condition, essentially can, local, um, can um, expand these, these local nano domains. And so now this kind of gives us a tool that we can use to perturb these domains uh, experimentally. Um, and what's nice is they actually found that this swelling of these domains seems to be localized, particularly to these gap junction regions, um, and doesn't seem to affect regions at the interpolated disk that are um, not um, directly um, adjacent to gap junctions. So, you know, uh, all of these kind of experimental pieces of evidence start to paint, paint a, a fairly complicated story of uh, the signaling that's happening um, at the intercalated disk. Um, but essentially, it, it, it demonstrates that we really have now all of the, the necessary pieces of, uh, of, uh, of regulation that are um, a part of a, a, a potentially a different mechanism for cell-cell coupling, which is known as a faptic coupling. Um, and so a faptic coupling essentially requires kind of two main pieces. And so one is that we have these, this high density of sodium channels. Um, and that those channels are on uh, membranes that are closely opposed to each other in fairly tight spaces. And so these two components lead to an additional mechanism that the cells can electrically communicate um, with each other. Um, so what is a faptic coupling for those uh, who don't know that term? So when we, we think about um, electrical coupling between cells, we all, or, or for most of us, are probably thinking of the fairly kind of dogmatic view of how cells are electrically coupling. And so this is a, a nice cartoon showing, you know, two different cells that are electrically coupled. We have these gap junctional proteins between the cells. And we think of electrical coupling as being facilitated essentially by direct um, ionic flow from one cell to the next. And so um, an, a depolarization in one cell will directly lead to a depolarization in the second cell. And so this is very much our dogmatic view of how these cells are electrically communicating. Um, now, a faptic coupling sort of posits a different mechanism that these um, can also communicate through each other. And so the basic idea of a faptic coupling is the following. So we, we know that if cell one is being activated, that's going to activate sodium channels that are on the membrane and in this intercalated disc region. So we have this inward flux of ions into the sodium channels. And we know that's going to increase the potential on the inside of our first cell but it's also going to decrease the potential in this space in between the two cells. And if this space is sort of small enough and narrow enough, this change in electrical potential between the cells is also going to be sensed by sodium channels on cell number two. And that difference can potentially be sufficient to activate these sodium channels on cell number two, which in turn increases the potential in cell number two. Right. And so essentially we have these two different mechanisms of electrical coupling that are acting um, potentially in parallel with each other. Um, so it's, it's worth emphasizing this is actually a, a relatively, um, well certainly not a, a terribly new idea. Um, Arkady Pertsov and Nick Sparalakis and, and a few others 
sort of posited a lot of these ideas theoretically in the, the 1970s. Um, and the basic idea um, can really sort of be postulated um, with a, a pretty simple model of, um, of the cardiac myocyte. And so this is a cartoon from Nick Sparalakis's work where he essentially illustrates two different cells that are electrically interacting with each other. And kind of the, the key insight is to think of different regions of the cells um, being represented by different um, electrical components. So we essentially have um, some components um, that are on sort of the lateral or axial membrane and then some that are at this intercalated disc region. And so the key idea is that if you think about there being an electrical resistance that is in this um, intercellular space, um, just from sort of simple ideas from Ohm's law, if, if this resistor is fairly high, a large resistance can lead to a potentially very large voltage difference in this intercellular space. And the idea is that as that space gets narrow, that's going to increase the resistance out of that space. And that potential voltage difference in turn is then what's able to activate the channels on the sodium channels on cell number two. Right? And so that's sort of the basic theoretical idea of, of how this, this um, baptic coupling mechanism can work. All right, so trying to get back to the bigger story, how, does, how do these ideas of a faptic coupling um, um, interact with, with long QT syndrome? And so a really other uh, sort of additional big piece of this puzzle came from some work from Jan Kuchera um, with Joram Rudy um, in the early 2000s, where they took this same basic idea of, of using a model to study a faptic coupling. So they, 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 they developed a, a model essentially of a one-dimensional tissue, uh, one dimensional tissue. So we have cells that are essentially coupled um, in a chain. And kind of the key idea is that, so similar to the work from Sparalakis, they have this um, region in their model that accounts for electrical coupling in between the intercellular space. Um, and so what they did is they then simulated this model for um, varying degrees of gap junctional coupling. So here they're varying how well coupled they are by gap junctions, and then varied this cleft width. And so the, the key idea is that as the width between the cells gets narrower, that resistance becomes a larger. And so these aphaptic effects become stronger. And so the key insight that they found is that as that cleft width gets narrower, the con conduction velocity begins to decrease. And there's actually this kind of interesting regime where you have this kind of biphasic curve. And so what's sort of the significance of this? Well, essentially the, the predictions um, from these studies essentially showed that aphaptic coupling can essentially self-limit the sodium current. Um, and they actually gave this phenomenon a na the name of uh, self-attenuation. And so the, the basic idea is this. So in our depolarizing cell, again, we have this sodium influx, which causes that decrease in the potential in the extracellular space. And so that increases the voltage on the neighboring cell. And what they found is that if that increase in the neighboring cell became so large, it could begin to approach the reversal potential of the sodium channels on the second cell, um, which in turn would decrease the sodium current and that decrease in sodium current could also slow conduction. Um, there's actually an additional mechanism which they didn't quite study in this, um, in this paper, which is also that as there's this inward flux of sodium into that first cell, that also begins to locally deplete the sodium between the two cells, and that's going to decrease the reversal potential for sodium. And so both of these effects essentially are reducing the driving force for that peak sodium current, reducing the peak current in turn is what slows conduction. And that's essentially what's responsible for this conduction slowing as the cleft width gets narrower. And so then putting all of these pieces together, our, our hypothesis that we wanted to study in this work is that this mechanism of self-attenuation, where we have this local depletion of sodium and reducing of um, the sodium current driving force, perhaps in mutant channels, we have the same potential mechanism where we have this reduction of not just the peak current that slows conduction, but also this reduction in the late sodium current, and that perhaps this is responsible for suppressing EADs. And so perhaps this mechanism that, re that conceals the long QT phenotype in these patients where they don't really have any, sym any symptoms um, could come from these structural changes associated with the intercalated disc. Right, so that's sort of the, the big hypothesis. And so we first wanted to test this in models and then also begin to test these, things, these ideas experimentally as well.
So the first step was to essentially assemble a model that's capable of testing these questions. And so we started with a, a fairly similar framework as the, the, the um, Jan Kutro's model, so the model from the, the previous slide. Um, and so the key idea here is that we have this electrical circuit representing um, again, a 1D chain of cells that are coupled. They're coupled by gap junctions, and they're also coupled by this effective coupling mechanism. And one of the, the key pieces of the model is that we actually have multiple different circuits representing different regions of the cell. And so the key um, component of that is that allows us to, to, to define where sodium channels are localized, whether they're localized at the interpolated disk or, or other regions of the cell. We also needed to replicate the dynamics of these long QT um, associated mutations. And so we adopted work from Colleen Clancy, who developed a, a Markov chain model of the sodium uh, channel that um, has this long QT associated phenotype. And so this is essentially a Markov chain that's representing um, 13 different states of the sodium channel. And kind of the key um, com um, sort of feature of this model is that there's essentially a series of states which are referred to as a burst mode state. And really their key feature is that these channels, um, these states aren't able to inactivate. And so this is essentially, there's a population of channels that fail to inactivate and that ultimately leads to this late sodium current. And then ultimately a key piece that we found um, that really had to be incorporated into the model is that we also needed to account for sodium in that um, intercellular cleft. And so we have equations that track the dynamics of sodium in that cleft space. And so ultimately we end up with a fairly large system of equations. Um, these are actually a, a sort of a fairly complicated system of equations. They, they don't fall under kind of the typical differential equations. Um, they're actually a system of differential algebraic equations. Um, so they're a little bit trickier to solve. Um, nonetheless, we can develop techniques to solve them. Um, and we essentially end up with a series of conservation equations. So we have conservation of electric current, conservation of mass or through ion fluxes. And then we also have to keep track of gating variables, which represent the states of different um, ion channels. And so this sort of gives us the details of our, our model. All right, so now we, we're all set up to actually test, um, test out these hypotheses and to run some simulations. And so here we're showing the um, membrane voltage, the sodium channel um, open probability um, on uh, channels at the intercalated disk. The current at the the sodium current at the intercalated disk, and then also this sodium reversal potential, and so just remember this is actually again a one D um, cable or chain of cells, um, but we're just showing two different locations just for clarity. Um, and so we first look at the case where we have a wild type version of the channel of the sodium channel, and then also for the case where the cleft between the cells is relatively wide. And we see things look fairly normal, nothing terribly exciting, right? We see normal um, action potentials, our sodium channel sort of rapidly activates and inactivates, and very little is changing with the sodium reversal potential. Um, if we look for the case where we have the wild type channel, but now a narrow cleft, the action potential looks fairly similar and the sodium current itself looks fairly similar. But we actually have this sort of transient change in the reversal potential. And what's actually happening here is, is during the action potential upstroke, is we have this rapid influx of sodium, which begins to locally deplete sodium in the cleft, which transiently decreases this reversal potential, and then it begins to gradually refill. So by the time the next beat comes along, everything is sort of back to its steady state level. So the action potential doesn't look very different, um, but we do sort of see this transient dynamics um, in the reversal potential. So now if we look at the case where we have the mutation, things look obviously quite a bit different. So in the action potential, we have this very long series of these EADs, right? So this is clearly the arrhythmic phenotype that we're, we're interested in studying. Um, if we look at the open probability, again, we see that there's this, you know, prolonged period where the channels are, are open. We see this, in, you know, inward sodium current that is our late sodium current. And in this case, there's very little happening with the reversal potential. And so then finally, we can look at our fourth case where now we have the mutant channel but now the cleft between the cells at the intercalated disk is narrow. And lo and behold, it looks fairly normal, right? The, the action potentials are a little bit longer than the wild type, but still fairly normal. Um, but what's interesting is we see that the channels themselves are open, right? So we have this enhanced open probability that's associated with the mutation. And we have sort of a little bit of a late sodium current, but not enough to really cause this really dramatic prolongation that leads to EADs. And so what's happening 
is that we see that there's um, actually this uh, essentially a negative feedback mechanism that's taking place. And so what we see is if we look at the reversal potential um, for the in the blue case, the, for the mutant with the narrow cleft, is we have this initial um, decrease um, in the reversal potential, which starts to recover. But then this late sodium current itself causes a second depletion locally, which then in turn causes another decrease in the reversal potential. And this decrease in reversal potential decreases this late sodium current and essentially turns it off. And so essentially this whole mechanism or this whole process is essentially a negative feedback mechanism, which we think about from sort of a physiological standpoint would be desirable, right? It's essentially a self-regulation where the late current uh, turns itself off and prevents the formation of arrhythmias. And we see that this in particular um, requires this narrowing of this intercellular space. Right? And so that's kind of the big picture, this sort of these posits of potential mechanism um, where um, changes in the spacing at the intercalated disc are able to potentially suppress the formation of these EADs. Um, and so we can again sort of look at this over, you know, different conditions to get a sense of, you know, where exactly do we see these, um, the formation of these EADs. So here we're varying the cleft width and looking at the action potential duration. And we see for the wild type case shown in black, again, there's very little change, um, which is kind of what we'd expect based on the, the previous slide. Um, but if we look at the mutation, we see that there's sort of this series of steps where each of these is corresponding to, um, potentially longer and longer EADs. And so for narrow clefts, we see an action potential fairly similar to the wild type, whereas for a wide cleft, we see a fairly prolonged um, um, action potential duration. Uh, we can also look at this as a function of the cycle length. So we can look at how does this depend on the pacing rate of, of, um, of the tissue. And so um, as we uh, increase the cycle length for the wild type case shown in black and green, there's sort of a, a gradual increase in the action potential duration, which is fairly typical of restitution, um, but it's fairly small. Whereas for the mutation, we see um, once we get to right around 900 milliseconds, which is already a fairly slow rate for a guinea pig, which is the model that we're using here, there's suddenly this fairly large increase in the action potential duration, and we see very long EADs. And so one thing that's nice is this is fairly consistent with what's seen clinically. So long QT3 is, is typically manifests under bradycardic conditions, or for, which would correspond to long cycle lengths here. Whereas at faster cycle lengths, we see fairly similar um, action potential durations, which we, we see here. And so that's sort of a nice finding that's, that's consistent with what we would expect clinically. And so we also wanted to have a sense of, you know, do these sort of predictions actually hold up? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this has been a really nice collaboration with Steve Polzing at Virginia Tech. Um, and so some work that was done with his, um, at the time, uh, PhD student, uh, Amara Greer Short, was to look at um, these ideas in, a, in a, a pharmacological model of long QT3. And so this is work that was done in um, guinea pig hearts. And so sort of the first thing to do was to get a sense of, of could the pharmacological model of long QT3, could we use the same perturbations to perturb the intercalated disc as that are also, as well as perturbations that are used to um, promote this um, pharmacological model of long QT3. So a particular toxin known as ATX2 is a fairly common agent um, that's used to promote a late sodium current. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we know that mannitol, um, the, the Polzin group had previously shown is sort of a, a nice osmotic agent tool that can be used to change the spacing um, at the intercalated disc. And so the first thing to just verify is that those two drugs don't interact with each other in any sort of unexpected ways. And so here is a quantification of the, of the cleft width at the perinexus for the mannitol case and for ATX2. And so we see that um, ATX2 by itself um, is fairly similar to control conditions. That's, that's not shown here, but we, we have measurements from other studies. Um, and then the combination of these two is fairly simil similar to just mannitol by itself. And so this suggests that adding ATX2 and mannitol essentially has the same effect at the perinexus as um, mannitol by itself. Right? So that sort of suggests that we have now a set of tools that we can use to both promote the long QT phenotype and then also perturb the intercalated disc uh, structurally. So this is what we can then uh, perform um, optical mapping. So these are now measures of action potential duration in Langendorf-perfused um, guinea pig hearts. And so here is now plots of the uh, 
action potential ration um, as a function of cycle length. And so kind of the first sort of control condition is just looking at mannitol versus control by itself. And we see that those are fairly similar to each other, which is nice. This is again, sort of essentially analogous to comparing our wild type wide case with our wild type narrow case. Um, the addition of ATX2 is again, sort of comparable to adding um, or comparable to having the mutation. And so we see that it does prolong the action potential, which is what we'd expect because it does promote a late sodium current. Um, but then the combination of ATX2 um, and mannitol combined prolongs the action potential even more. And this effect actually becomes more and more pronounced at slower heart rates. And so certainly qualitatively, it's very similar to what we saw in the computational model, um, which is certainly a nice uh, finding. And so um, the next thing that we can do is um, we can now use our model to at least make some predictions about how other features of the system could affect this behavior, right? We at least have a sense of from the experiments that potentially this mechanism holds. We certainly at least see experiments that are consistent with what the model predicts. And so we can start now making new predictions to get a sense of, of what we might expect. And so the first thing we were interested in in looking at was gap junctional coupling, right? Because there's often this idea that gap junctional coupling is very kind of critical for the um, formation of these EADs. And so the first thing we did is we varied gap junctional coupling in our model. Um, and so again, here are kind of the same series of traces. Um, gap junctional, um, increasing the gap junctional uh, resistance um, as would be expected would, uh, was shown to slow down conduction. So you can see that here in that with higher um, gap junctional resistances, the action potential is sort of showing up at a later time, right? So we have this typical conduction slowing that we'd expect um, as the gap junctional coupling um, is reduced. But when we actually look at the, EA, um, the EAD formation and look at action potential duration as a function of cleft width, is we can see that the dependence is actually fairly similar, right? Um, we still have this regime of narrow cleft width with, without EADs and high cleft width has EADs. There is some dependence where reducing gap junctional coupling does slightly promote EADs. But kind of the, the key finding from this is that the cleft width was a much more kind of critical parameter relative to changes in gap junctional resistance, which was, was certainly a, an interesting thing for the model to predict. Um, the other thing that we can start to, to get a sense of is, is you know, we, we talked about, or I talked about earlier that um, from microscopy, we have some sense that sodium channels are preferentially localized at the intercalated disc. So one natural question would be sort of how localized do they need to be? And so we can vary this in our model as well. And we found that somewhere on the order between 70 and 90% of the channels being localized at the intercalated disc essentially gave us very similar results. So these, these, these do require that the majority of channels are localized at the disc. Once we start getting into smaller numbers, somewhere between 50 and 10% is essentially a uniform distribution in our model, um, we start losing this effect. So the sodium channels do need to be localized at the intercalated disc in order for these effects to manifest. And then finally, this is kind of one of my, my, my favorite studies because it's, it's a really nice example of, of performing a simulation that you could almost, that would be essentially impossible to do experimentally. Um, and so when I was talking about kind of the mechanisms of a fat decoupling, we talked about there being really kind of two key pieces, right? There's this change in the electrical potential um, in the intercellular space. And then there's also these changes in sodium concentration. And in practice, those are of course gonna be sort of coupled to each other, right? Because changes in um, ion concentration affect electrical potential. Um, but in a computational model, we can untease the, or sort of separate out the effects of those two um, by essentially performing different clamping experiments. And so what we did here is we, we looked at the case where under, under um, sort of baseline conditions, the um, EADs are suppressed. So this is a case where the cleft width is narrow. And then we looked at the case where we either took out the electrical field coupling, which is essentially is the same as clamping the intercellular cleft at its sort of baseline value of zero, or we clamped the cleft sodium concentration at its baseline value. So we essentially prevent um, depletion of local sodium. And then we can do those two in combination as well. And sort of the key thing that we see is that in either of the cases where we clamped the sodium concentration, um, which essentially means we didn't allow for depletion of sodium in the extra, uh, in the intercellular cleft, we see EADs, right? So this, this sort of mechanism of suppressing EADs is lost. And so essentially what that tells us is that the depletion of sodium in the intercellular cleft is really the critical component for 
seeing this effect where we suppress EADs. In contrast, when we clamp the electric field, we don't see that effect. So changing the electric field or, or suppressing the changes in the electric field look very, very similar. And so that tells us, you know, now we have a sense of which mechanism is actually sort of driving these changes. Um, and then one sort of additional study that we can do, and this kind of ties back to some of the complications um, that I talked about in the very beginning, that different mutations um, potentially, um, they manifest very similar, similarly in terms of showing this late sodium current, um, but are potentially treated or need to be treated very differently because they respond to drugs very differently. We found that essentially this mechanism is completely independent of the specific mutation. So we perform simulations where we use a, a, essentially a very different model of a different sodium channel mutation, which has, has similarly has a late sodium current, but isn't caused by the same mechanism as the other mutation. And sort of the, you know, the quantitative dependencies change a little bit, but the same mechanism essentially arises. So here we're showing the mutation and the action potential duration for this different mutation. And similarly for a narrow cleft, we don't see EADs whereas for a wide cleft, we do. And so that at least potentially suggests that, um, you know, this is a mechanism that is independent of the mutation. And we actually did some other studies, which I'm not showing here, which also show this is species independent. So these were in guinea pig, but we also did simulations in a, in a canine model and essentially show the same thing. So really just, I think, you know, I'm doing a little bit slow on time. So just kind of two last results. Um, so some um, really nice work from my, my PhD, uh, PhD student, Madison Novak, has kind of picked up this project in the last couple of years. And so one of the first things we wanted to look at is to look at um, uh, the sort of make, make predictions in a, in a little bit of a more realistic setting um, when we look at these different osmotic agents. So we, we know from sort of different studies of looking at the effects of these agents on tissue, as these, as the, these agents often have sort of multiple effects in terms of changing um, the extracellular spaces. So they can affect not just the, the cleft, the intercellular cleft, but they can also affect sort of more bulk interstitial tissue properties, um, and mannitol in particular being one of them. And so Madison's done some really nice work to essentially expand this model to also mimic changes in the intercellular, or sorry, interstitial uh, space, and essentially shows that um, really the changes in the interstitial space have, have very little effect. Um, so really the localization of the channel um, and changes in the cleft width are essentially the only, are essentially the, the main property that govern whether or not we see EADs. So here we're, we're varying interstitial width and kind of these different conditions, and there's very, very little dependence. And then lastly, I'll kind of end with a, a little bit of a, a tease of kind of where things are going, which is to try to get back to kind of the question at the very, very beginning, which is how does this depend on age, right? Because we, you know, kind of set up the question or the, the problem as being, uh, you know, we're interested in understanding why is this um, arrhythmia potentially concealed in younger patients and what are potentially responsible for the, the changes that cause the arrhythmia to actually manifest. Um, and so this is still um, some ongoing work um, but uh, a couple of things that we kind of do know, um, so we've actually potentially partly um, talked about some of the age associated changes. Um, so it's, it's been known for a little while that um, this localization of sodium channels to the intercalated disc actually is very much an age dependent process. So in sort of early neonatal stages, channels are much more uniformly um, distributed, and then really only towards sort of later stages of development do they redistribute to the intercalated disc. So that's certainly, um, if anything, that actually suggests sort of an age-associated protective mechanism, right, which is kind of counter to what we're, we're seeing. Um, but one of the interesting findings that at least the model predicts so far is actually that something as simple as cell size is actually a fairly decent predictor of these EAD, um, in, in the formation of these EADs. And so this is kind of showing a, a similar simulation that I've shown before. Um, so again, we're looking at the case where the cleft is relatively wide. So under kind of the baseline case shown in black, we have these EADs, we have this you know, late sodium current. But then as we decrease the size of the cell, we begin to suppress these EADs. And this seems to be mostly just kind of driven by changes in the total late sodium current. Um, so we're still trying to tease out sort of a lot of these other effects because age is obviously a very complicated process and a lot of these changes are sort of happening in, in concert. Um, but perhaps to me, one of the more surprising results is that cell size is, seems to be unto itself a fairly decent predictor. Um, 
And so with that, I'll sort of give a quick summary. Um, so hopefully this, this talk has motivated your interest in, in thinking about the intercalated disk and particularly in the, in the context of long QT and sodium channel mutations. Um, our, our study kind of suggests or certainly you know, defines sort of this mechanism where both changes in the intercellular width as well as localization of sodium channels are this potential mechanism for suppressing um, arrhythmias and concealing this phenotype. Um, from sort of a therapeutic standpoint, this is particularly interesting because this is a protective mechanism that doesn't depend on the specific uh, form of the mutation and sort of more broadly, you know, implicates sodium signaling at the intercalated disc. Um, so our future directions are really trying to delve more deeply into some of the clinical implications of this. So I've kind of already alluded to, we're, we're thinking about how these changes are occurring in with tissue structure in terms of age. Um, one natural question, which I'll just sort of throw out and then not answer, um, which is, does the intercalated disc cleft with, does that cleft with seem to change with age? Um, we don't exactly know that yet, but that's sort of a potential hypothesis. And our, our collaborators are very much kind of in the midst of those studies. It would certainly be consistent with what we're seeing here, but we, we don't quite know that yet. Um, but regardless, it, it also suggests that there are potential therapeutic targets that are potentially independent of the mutation, right? And again, kind of calling back to that earlier work, um, you know, the, the drugs that are specifically targeting the ion channel, right, need to be fairly specific to the mutation, whereas this is at least potentially a mechanism that's independent of it. Um, and so that certainly, I think, is, is you know, a, a potentially significant finding. Um, and so finally, I'll just give some thanks and acknowledgements. So this has been a, a really nice uh, collaboration with many groups uh, within my own group. Um, Madison Novak, uh, no, uh, Novak, as I mentioned, has done some really nice work. Um, and we also have a new postdoc, Nick, who's kind of picked up some new aspects of the project. Um, we worked really closely with some, some fantastic experimental groups. Um, I didn't really have time to, to talk about some of the work from Isabel Deschen's group um, that's been connected with this project. Uh, as, um, and we've also had some really nice collaborations uh, and, and work from Steve Polzing and, and Sai, my, my colleague here at OSU. And again, I'll also acknowledge our, our funding from NIH. And with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thank you, Seth. Such a wonderful talk. Um, I see that there are already some questions in the Q&A box. I invite anybody else to uh, please type them in. Uh, and I see also some of the questions are questions that I would have asked. So I just go, I'm going to go for a quick one before reading those. And so I saw you looked at, uh, you know, how many sodium channels really need, need to be localized in the intercalated disks in order for these uh, uh, phenomena to occur. Have you looked at any other proteins, uh, namely, for example, uh, you know, NKA, for example? Or... Um, yes. <laughs> um, so I guess, yes, with a to be determined. So yes, there's, there's some other evidence of electrogenic proteins at the intercalated disc NKA. Um, there seemed to be some evidence for potassium channels. Um, I think I saw, uh, I've seen a study that even talks about um, sodium calcium exchanger um, being at the intercalated disc. Um, we've just started um, looking into what the models predict in those settings. Um, and so I'd say it's, I would say it's too early for me to really comment. We've kind of decided, you know, the initial idea was to get sort of a pretty solid understanding of what happens when you think of just sodium channels. But then obviously, you know, since the model predicts that the changes in sodium concentration are really key, certainly things like NCX, NKA are going to be really critical. Um, I'll give, I guess, some answer that I can give is that I, my thought is that they're probably there as protective mechanisms also, right? To kind of prevent that depletion from getting too out of control, right? Um, but uh, the short answer is I don't know, but I think it's a great question and we're, and we're looking at it. All right, so first question is from uh, Mike Shatok. Hi, Mike. He says, nice talk. Is there any evidence that particular um, NAV mutation, uh, sorry, uh, uh, channel mutations can preferentially traffic to the intercalated disc rather than the T-tubule? You mentioned some sodium channel mutations cause uh, EADs and some do not. Do you think that those that traffic to the T-tubule might activate more L-type calcium channels or more NCX, while those at the intercalated disks do not? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, there are some evidence. So there, I know there are mutations that are um, the, the mutations that that are associated more with trafficking proteins that um, can essentially either destabilize the proteins that otherwise would be trafficking trafficking to the intercalated disc, and so you essentially end up with a larger population um, either on the lateral membranes or at the T tubules. Um, I don't know if that's specifically associated with the NAV 1.5 mutations, but I know I've seen studies that are associated with mutations in the trafficking proteins that then lead to different populations. Um, I, 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 I be honest, I don't know specifically, um, uh, let's see, to answer the question, do I, does that trafficking mutation um, activate more um, L-type calcium channels? I, that, Seems like that would make sense. I, I mean, I I would imagine. So I know there's some evidence that the sodium channels at the T tubules, I, from what I re recall seeing, this is a little bit not exactly what I do or have looked at, um, but those can co-localize with NCX in the T tubules, I believe. And so my th I would sort of speculate that they may be similarly um, interact um, at the T tubule, but that's that's kind of about what I would know. Yeah. Elisa, do you mind if I just ask a question that follows this up? Um, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by your work looking at the, the percentage of sodium channels that need to be at that location in, in order to you, for you to see an EAD, for example. I mean, I guess a lot of that work is based on, I mean, some of the immunofluorescence um, uh, work that actually not many labs can see. Um, you know, for example, I, I've tried doing this myself and I don't really see enrichment of sodium channels often at the, um, you know, at the gap junctions. So, you know, I, and I don't know, maybe it's because I'm doing things wrongly, <laughs> which is probably very likely. But, you know, do you really think that 80% or even 50% of the sodium channels will be really uh, placed or based uh, in, that, in that particular area? Is that really a, a likely scenario? So, hang on, I think it's a great question. I'll, I'll give a couple different answers that address different pieces of that. So in terms of the, uh, the immuno imaging, I will say, again, this is not the work that I do, but from conversations with my experimental collaborators, I've heard that the NAV 1.5 antibodies are, I guess, notoriously difficult. Um, and so I know a lot of the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the groups from Rob Gordy and, and Cy now at OSU, um, these are things that they've thought about quite deeply, I guess, and, they, and probably talking to them to, in terms of the, the sort of technical details of, of what their, how their antibodies are different than sort of commercially available ones. But, but my understanding is that there is sort of a lot of challenges with the antibodies. And so that they've sort of exerted a lot of effort to, you know, to, to improve that aspect of, of sort of the imaging um, challenges. Um, and so I guess to more specifically answer your question, I think it's hard to put one particular number and that's, you know, sort of why, you know, I don't necessarily see the model as predicting there must be 80% and 75 isn't enough. I think it sort of suggests a mechanism, right? It's it, it, that percentage is also going to depend on the cleft width. It's also going to depend on the expression. And so all of these things kind of depend on each other in complicated ways. It does certainly require that I would say the majority of proteins uh, of sodium channels are probably more than 50%. I mean, that's at least kind of using reasonable numbers, but I think I would, I would be hesitant to say that like one hard number is like a threshold. Um, and so, you know, there's also sort of a rate dependence, right? So slower rates sort of manifest these effects even more. So I think the model is really is valuable in the sense that it sort of posits a mechanism and it determines the dependencies. And I'm less confident in saying that there's a specific number. Um, yeah, but hopefully that kind of, create, yeah. if you create a lot of ionic traffic in that area, you know, um, through basically having a lot of channels there, then of course you're more likely to to induce an EAD, you know. Um, right. Whereas if you have less of it, or maybe more physiologically relevant concentrations of the channels, then maybe you won't. I, I don't know. I'm just wondering. You know, uh, you probably thought about this far more than I did. You know, I, I did a few immunofluorescent stains and just gave up and said I can't see it. So I'm clearly not very good. But 
I mean, I know there's been multiple groups that have found sodium channels localized at, at the intercalated disc. And in fact, I remember some earlier studies actually failed to find them anywhere else, right? That they found very few on the lateral membrane. So I, I, I think there's pretty convincing evidence that there certainly is a population at the intercalated disc. What percentage it is, I think is tougher to answer, but I, I do think it's fair. I do think, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty convinced that the evidence is that there, there are oh, populations. I, there. There, but yeah. I just don't think, I just haven't seen them being enriched. <laughs> but, uh, so, but yeah, sorry, I, I am taking all this, so please continue. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would consider the enrichment also some sort of a controversial is, issue still, because there are also functional data looking at, for example, the tubulated myocytes, in which you lose at least 10% of the sodium current. So that probably yeah. is possible. Yeah. Oh, this is this is the other point I was actually going to add to that, right? Um, and there's a study from from Mario Delmar's group too. I, I want to say Lynn is the first author, but I might be thinking of a different study. So that, that may be I may be misquoting the wrong paper. I know there's a study from their group that specifically looked at um, patching sodium currents at different regions of the cell, and they definitely find a population at the intercalated disc. Um, I think quantifying a percentage from that is a little bit tough, right? And then there's also sort of the question of when you isolate cells, right? The intercalated disc is now disrupted, right? So it's not exactly the native setting, which is obviously a very big technical limitation. Um, but even in that setting where the cells are disrupted, they do still find distinct populations at the intercalated disc, right? And so that's at least a functional validation that's beyond the, uh, the immunoimaging too. And when you do the manitol experiments, do you think any of the ultrastructure, cellular ultrastructure is modified, like T-tubules, for example, are they also? Uh, that's a good question. I, <laughs> um, I, I potentially do. And, and that is, again, sort of additional complication. So I, in, in these models, we didn't specifically distinguish between sodium channels at the T-tubules versus sort of other parts of the lateral membrane. It's just sort of channels at the disc versus not at the disc. Um, but you're right. But I, I, I think the, the mannitol is potentially having other effects, which is complicated. And actually, again, both of our, our, our experimental collaborators are working on kind of getting away from using the osmotic agents because they do have some of these off-target effects and developing tools to really directly target the channel um, without sort of these secondary effects. All right. I'm, I'm going to move on and take another question. Jeff Sosserman. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Nice talk. <clears throat> it, se it seems like effective coupling would depend critically on diffusion and isolation from the broader extracellular space. Has this been probed directly by fluorescent dyes, which could allow for imaging or sharp kinetics, or any genetically encoded voltage reporters targeted to that space? Yeah, that, Jeff, that's uh, a really great question. Um, the short answer is no, but we've talked about it a lot. So again, I, I don't entirely understand the, the technical aspects, but my, I mean, again, we're thinking about, we're talking about, you know, nano domain spaces. So I think, you know, getting voltage sensitive reporters into those spaces and sort of accurately reporting it from my, again, my understanding is that these are very technically challenging aspects. Um, obviously that would be great. It would be really important to have a sense of, are these changes in, in local sodium um, happening? Certainly, you know, on the magnitudes that the model predicts or just really at all. Um, I will say we did try to probe that question a little bit experimentally um, because you, you, you picked up on something that is, is, is really insightful, which is that diffusion with the broader extracellular space is actually a, a pretty critical piece, um, but it, it was surprisingly less critical than I expected. Um, and so if you think back to the, the, the trace where you kind of see the recovery of the um, sodium reversal potential, and that's essentially driven by diffusion so sodium diffusing from the bulk back into the, the intercellular space. Um, and so if you, we can vary the time constant associated essentially with that, with that diffusion, you know, with that recovery via diffusion. Um, and if that recovery is really, really fast, so if, if it's, you know, in the case where the, the cleft is very well diffusively coupled with the bulk, then the sodium concentration recovers extremely fast. And actually most of these effects essentially go away, right? Because you don't have that local depletion on the time scale of the action potential duration. Um, if it gets really, really slow to the point that it never recovers, then at some point you can actually just block conduction altogether because at some point you just don't have any sodium in the cleft and there's just, there's no sodium to drive, you know, action potentials on subsequent beats. 
Um, but there's a pretty wide range in between those two extreme cases. Um, and, you know, it changes results a little bit quantitatively, but qualitatively, everything stays about the same. So as long as there is diffusion with the bulk and it's not super fast and it's not basically zero, really anything in between, as long as at some point the, the space does recover, most of these effects um, still sort of manifest, um, which I thought was surprising. I thought the model would be extremely sensitive to that time, time scale, and it's surprisingly not that sensitive. Um, which is interesting. So, I mean, it still sort of motivates the, the experiment because it would still be great to actually see these changes experimentally. Um, but again, the model predicts that it's fairly insensitive, which is nice. Uh, Ali, do you, do you mind if I just ask one, one follow up here again? Sorry, I'm just curious about this work. So that's why I'm asking lots of questions. Um, what's the, to what extent does a faptic coupling contrib contribute to conduction? Um, you know, yeah, that's a nice controversial question. <laughs> um, so, you know, my, you know, I, I, I try to always give a somewhat political answer to that question because I, I, I and, and not because I'm trying to be overly apolitical, because I actually believe that I, I think they're kind of two mechanisms that work in concert. Um, so, and, you know, my sense is that, you know, hopefully this study kind of convinces that a lot of these aphaptic coupling mechanisms are sort of a protective mechanism in the setting of this sodium channel mutation. But there's obviously lots of settings where there's not a sodium channel mutation. And my sense is, is you know, how, how much of a role does it play under normal conduction? I think it modulates things. I think, you know, kind of the, the work from young, you know, young Kuchera that showed, you know, changing the cleft width could change conduction velocity. I think there's sort of a dependence um, on cases where gap junctional coupling becomes much um, weaker, aphaptic coupling actually plays a, a larger role and, and essentially becomes protective. So again, kind of similar in this setting where if gap junctional coupling is very reduced, then aphaptic coupling can actually enhance conduction. Um, and so my sense is that they are probably kind of this co-regulated process where, you know, the, the idea, you know, with the idea being that both sort of are designed to protect conduction in as many settings as possible. Um, and so I, I, I'm always hesitant to say sort of an either or, because I really think both work in concert and are sort of necessary to respond to, you know, the perturbations that our heart sort of constantly faces. Okay, thank you. Jeff has another question, which is, have there been reported changes in the geometry of the intercalated disc in patients with the uh, NAV mutation? So that is a good uh, question. So it has, I don't, so the, no, I, it has not been specifically reported, but I also don't think it's been specifically studied. Um, it has been shown in atrial fibrillation patients, actually. There's, there's a really nice study um, from uh, Sai, I think is the first author, and I know Steve Polzing is one of the authors. I honestly can't remember who's the senior author. Um, where they looked at atrial fibrillation patients and they do see perturbed um, sort of expansions at the intercalated disc that are, they're actually pretty severe. Um, they, so I don't think it's been specifically looked at in, in um, long QT patients, but again, that would be great. I mean, certainly a perfect study would be to look at long QT patients that do sort of have arrhythmias and then those that don't and look at tissue from both of those. That would be a wonderful study, um, but one that you know hasn't been done yet. But presumably these changes could be localized rather than, you know, just sort of equally distributed, a bit like adiposity in tissue and the fibrosis, right? Uh, you, you might get right. foci, foci, you know, foci uh, that are sort of altered and that acts as a substrate for your arrhythmia rather than sort of being present everywhere. True. All right. So that's you a very good find them anyway. Well, that's what I'm saying. Agreed. Next question is from Claudia Altomare. Hi, Claudia. Very interesting webinar. Um, there are differences in the distribution of connexin-43 and sodium between left and right cardiomyocytes. It manifests the same electrophysiological cardiotoxic effect of doxorubicin, but differences in echo echocardiographic recordings of in vivo models. Uh, um, so I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Um, I guess the question is, are maybe differences between right left ventricle. and right ventricles? Um, do those differences maybe affect 
Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, My understanding of this question is that uh, Claudia is trying to say potentially, and Claudia, feel free to get back to us to clarify, but I think she's trying to say that there are examples where connexin 43 expression is altered um, between the left and right, but then um, there are no effects of doxorubicin on this, even though there are still expected changes in echo echocardiographic changes. So maybe contractile effects are different, but response to cardiorubicin, uh, doxorubicin is diff uh, still altered. I don't know. Sorry, I didn't quite clarify. Maybe you can clarify. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can move on and Claudia can clarify. Uh, Sina Adipur Lakmesari. Hi, Sina. Thanks for the talk. What is the mechanism behind the delayed presentation of long QT3? Uh, why doesn't long QT3 manifest until later in life? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I hopefully I touched on that at, at, at a little bit at the end. So, I mean, the short answer is, is we don't strictly know. Um, but some ideas are one that there could be these kind of tissue structural changes that, you know, the model kind of postulates, right? So there could be changes at the intercalated disc in older patients that you don't have in, in younger patients. Um, that's sort of a hypothesis that we would love to kind of test. Um, and then some of the work that we're, we're doing, um, is trying to look at sort of the other age associated changes. And so kind of, you know, I, as a bit of a, a teaser for work that's not quite uh, done yet is, is looking at even just in changes in cell size, which we know, you know, change with age um, seems to be sort of a, a factor. Um, so increasing just the cell size in the model led to, you know, higher incidence of, of um, EADs. And so that is potentially um, a factor. But it's a good question, and the short answer is we're still working on it. Anonymous attendee. Hi, anonymous attendee. Very nice talk. Do you think common comorbidities such as diabetes, obesity, affect the intercellular cleft and worsen lung QT syndrome? Um, that is a good, uh, good question. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. So I think it's possible... Um, that, well, certainly any disorder that's disrupting, you know, sort of the tissue structure. And, um, you know, I, it's, I think there are some of these structural defects that occur in diabetes. Um, but I don't, I don't think certainly anyone's looked at it, particularly at the, at the interpolated disc. Um, and I mean, you know, these are, these are, this is, that's a really good question. I mean, my, I, I guess if I was completely speculating, I'd say yes, but I, um, you know, I, a lot of this hasn't really been looked at in disease models. Um, but it's th these are questions we're interested in and I would speculate that it could be. Yeah. So that what I'm continuing, right? Even if we are 10, 12, um, we don't have time limits here. No, no, no. So it's up to you to, to oh, run as long as you yeah, want. This is fun. Christopher Oshi. Hi, Christopher. Very nice talk. In the optical mapping experiment using ATX plus, uh, I guess it was Manitol or whatever else. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's meant well, Were any changes in conduction velocity observed alongside the APD changes and were the changes homogeneous across the tissue? Uh, so the first part I can say is yes. So there were there was conduction slowing um, that was associated with the mannitol, the cases that had mannitol, but not not ATX two by itself. Um, I'm trying to think, I so I didn't the the first author on that paper is Greer Short, and I know in that paper we have conduction velocity data. I just didn't presented here for, you know, to kind of simplify the story a little bit. I don't think there were significant CV changes um, in the ATX, ATX2 by itself case, but there were in the combined case. Um, I don't know if they were looked at spatially. So, I mean, I, um, I, I know that sort of global measures of conduction velocity were looked at. I don't think if they looked at regional heterogeneity. Um, I guess presumably that data is there, but I, I'm fairly certain it was only measured um, to sort of look at global conduction velocity changes. Um, that, that it would be interesting to know if there are. 
I guess that kind of ties with the earlier question of potentially different um, regional distributions of, of connexin 43 and, and sodium channels. Um, yeah, good question. Hi, Rika Tatmaya. Um, beautiful work, another eye opener for me. Two quick questions. I learned 50 years ago, the steeper the upslope of the action potential, the faster the conduction velocity. Still true? <laughs> <laughs> then could you comment of Ranolazine on the late sodium current? Yeah, um, good question. I feel like there's a lot of good questions and not a lot of good answers for me. Uh, um, so I, I, I don't actually know how much this, I, I, would, I guess I would still think that's true. Because um, even in the case of a faptic coupling, right, it's still essentially an activation of the sodium channel that's then accelerating um, or potentially slowing down conduction. Um, but I mean, the the question's right, and that it does kind of make a more complicated story, right? Because the the effects of the sodium channel kind of have multiple effects, right? There's the activation of the channel itself, and then if that you know, if these effects are really pronounced, then there's the slowing, you know, that you reduce the peak in some sense, and that slows down conduction. Um, I haven't really, at least in the model, I haven't specifically looked at correlating the, you know, the AP upstroke um, velocity with conduction velocity, just to see if that data holds under all conditions. But that would be certainly something we could do. It'd be a nice sort of easy thing to, to check. Um, so good question there. Um, and then in terms of renolazine, yeah, so that's also a question, right? So renolazine is this selective um, uh, late sodium channel blocker. Um, you know, we, uh, it, I mean, I, th I think, you know, at the end of the day, right, with, with any kind of treatment for long QT3, right, the goal is going to be something that's, you know, reducing the magnitude of this, this late sodium current. Um, and so, you know, in, in a case, for example, where renolazine doesn't necessarily work terribly well, one sort of thought that, you know, I've had in the context of, of you know, renolazine and kind of the ideas in, in this, in this uh, setting are that, you know, maybe perhaps one reason why renolazine doesn't work in some patients is perhaps, you know, the, the tissue substrate is such that, you know, if you had such a wide cleft that, even if you're able to only partially block the late sodium current, it's sort of not enough, um, if that makes sense. Right? So I guess another way of thinking of it is, is right, um, you know, narrowing the cleft is sort of this additional therapeutic, right, that could be reducing the late current. And so, you know, the case where renolazine may not work is just where, you know, the, the intercalated disc is sort of so wide that even if you're able to selectively target late sodium current, it would require so much to block the late sodium current that you start blocking, you know, peak current as well. And it starts becoming detrimental. Um, so that's at least potentially one idea of how, you know, the drug is maybe, um, you know, cases where the drug is not effective, where these kinds of um, issues become important. Anonymous attendee. Hi, anonymous attendee. Have you used long QT human IPSC to test your theory? Yes, that's also a good question. So we've we've talked about that a lot as well. So I think one of the issues is, do um, IPSC um, derived cardiomyocytes form mature intercalated discs? Um, and I would say, you know, five years ago, I don't know if there was much evidence that that happened, um, but I feel like I've seen, you know, in studies and, and conferences and presentations in the last couple of years that there are at least starting to form more mature intercalated discs. And so you're starting to have, you know, the structural components that would be necessary to test these. Um, I certainly think that's, it's a great idea, right? Because obviously you could look at specific sodium channel mutations. Um, you could also look at some of these like trafficking um, mutations that we talked about where, you know, perhaps in a genetic way you could perturb localization instead of just in a model. Um, these are great ideas. I, I don't, I don't know, again, my expertise isn't exactly in, in, um, you know, stem cell development, um, from, you know, the tissue engineering side, but I think as those techniques and in, in, in terms of developing sort of more native, um, intercalated discs, um, as sort of that progresses, I think then we can start to test these ideas. And that's again, on, on my experimental collaborators are getting a long list of, of ideas. <laughs> 
She'll be like, you know, Glue says, great talk. Thank you very much. And I apologize for butchering everybody's name. And then Tristan is saying that the a, a, I think the atrial fibrillation with the expansion ah. of the intercalated disc is his paper with uh, Steve Polzin. Thanks, Tristan. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm awful at remembering <laughs> those things, but thanks for clarifying. Laura Sommerfeld, thank you for your talk. Kind of following on the discussion about sodium channel enrichment at the intercalated disc. Maybe a naive question, but is it not also due to the nature of your model, 1D, that it predicts such a high importance of the um, intercalated disc pool of channels? Yeah, so that's a, a, good, a good question as well. Um, so we've definitely talked about expanding the dimensionality of the model, certainly 2 or 3D. I didn't go into to all of the weeds on, on the model. Um, but there's, it's, there's, um, the model itself is actually fairly computationally intensive um, because we're essentially modeling like the intercellular space or essentially we're simulating propagation across the cell. And so because of that, there's sort of faster dynamics that most models will typically just not represent. And so because of that, we have to use fairly small time steps. And so because of that, it becomes a very computationally taxing model. And so scaling it to higher dimensions, is, it's obviously doable from like a formulation standpoint, um, but it becomes much trickier to simulate certainly two or, or 3D just from like a computational standpoint. Um, but, but regardless, it, it, it is a good question, right? And, um, you know, I, again, it's, it's kind of a, a, maybe a bit of a hand wavy answer that it, it's, I, th I think sort of the same mechanism still hold because at the end of the day, it's, when these EADs manifest in this model, it's it's not like a focal activation where you know one cell or one group of cells activates and then those cells have to propagate out and depolarize the rest of the tissue. It really is you know sort of a substrate where you know all of the tissue or all of the cells in the tissue are capable of triggering these EADs. Now there's certainly you know the point that's kind of come up in a couple of the questions is there may there certainly is going to be structural heterogeneity. In different regions so there could be some regions that you know have wider clefts and therefore are more prone to trigger EADs and so there is certainly that the idea does become you know somewhat significant um, but I guess I would say that in the case where you know these effects are very pronounced and where all of the tissue has very wide intercalated discs I would expect that sort of the dimensionality of the problem becomes less significant because all of those cells can and would trigger EADs sort of very frequently that the dimension doesn't really matter as much, um, but it's a good it's a good point, and it's it's something that we're also interested in, in in trying to to work through. Seth, it's also a good way to make your PhD student hate you for the rest of their lives. Like, yeah, <laughs> I can imagine the, these uh, spaces in across the tissue, you know, lots of uh, cross sections. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. There are actually a couple studies that have kind of taken this effective coupling, coupled tissue, um, you know, formulation and expanded it to 2D. Um, and so it's certainly doable computationally, but just, I've, you know, I've talked to the, the folks in that group and it's, you know, it is the computational problems that we've thought about that will happen, do happen. And these are simulations that take, you know, very long time to run. And so, you know, I, the sort of the, the nice, you know, the beauty of having a relatively, um, you know, simple model, even though there's obviously a lot of details, is it gives us the ability to kind of do those studies that we did at the end, which is vary the distribution, vary the gap junctional coupling, and sort of tease out which of these mechanisms are important. Um, and so, yeah, it's certainly a trade-off, but it's, it's a good, it's a good point. So Claudia wrote back, thank you for doing so. Um, we have differences in echo recordings between left and right ventricular tissue where the damage by doxorubicin is evident at systolic level, but in right did not. So they have, a, uh, sorry. <laughs> However, the cellular cardiotoxic effect in electrophysiological features are the same in left and right cardiomyocytes. So electrophysiologically in cells, there is the effect, but then when they go in tissue, they see the damage in right ventricle, but not in left. Ah, okay. Do you think that the differences between tissue and cellular level could be due to some differences in electrical coupling due to sodium channels and connexin 43? Okay. Um, 
yeah, again, the short answer is I, I don't really know. Um, I don't know if, um, and again, maybe I know I see Tristan's kind of chatting. So maybe, maybe he knows, cause this is work that was, that would have potentially been done in, in Steve, Steve Polzing's group. I don't know if they've looked at regional differences, um, between left and right, um, in terms of looking at the intercalated discs or, or distributions, um, of sodium channels. So I, I, I don't know if those exist. I'm not sure if they've looked at it. Um, um, so it, it's, it's certainly possible, right? I mean, these, these, I mean, as it's kind of come up, there certainly are going to be regional differences in these properties. Um, but I, I don't think they're known, um, at least not by me, I guess. Yeah. There are a couple of questions in the chat as well. Um, one says, uh, is from Leo Ch Cherian Ozatil. Um, thanks and very interesting. Um, that's fibroblasts. Do fibroblasts have any effect on effaptic coupling? Uh, that's also a good question. Um, so we've thought about trying to test that in the models for sure, um, um, but haven't actually kind of done that yet. Um, so I, I think, I guess it could play a role in potentially multiple ways, right? So, um, you know, again, as, as I, I guess kind of went through in the very beginning, right, kind of the the key components of a faptic coupling, at least from kind of like a theoretical standpoint are, you know, these clusters of channels in small spaces and the membranes being sort of closely packed. And so, you know, I could see fibroblasts sort of indirectly affecting that by just, you know, in fibrotic tissue disrupting, you know, the structure of the intercalated disc by, you know, physically changing the, the geometry. Um, whether there's more complicated effects where, Right. I mean, there's there's some evidence, although I mean, it also seems to be fairly controversial that gap junctions can form between cardiomyocytes and and fibroblasts. Um, I'm definitely not weighing in on that one, but I guess I would say that if they do form gap junctions um, and channels similarly would cluster to those gap junctions, then you know potentially the electrical effects of the of the fibroblast would impact it in a similar way as they do. Um, in kind of the story that I told here, um, whether that happens or even what exactly the model would predict, I don't know. It's an interesting idea, um, again, because obviously fibroblasts have a different complement of, of, of um, ionic uh, channels and what kind of, like, it's not necessarily just to, do they form gap junctions, but what's the actual structure, right? Because it's, you know, there is this sort of close, you know, nano domain spaces where you have clustering of channels. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think anyone's looked at that. If they are, I'm certainly not aware of it, but it would be an interesting thing to just kind of test out in a model even just to see what happens if there was that coupling and how could that affect things like, um, you know, conduction velocity and, and things like that. Um, Cause it would certainly be relevant in fibrosis. So yeah, it's a good question. The controversy to the, to the power of controversy, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a faptic coupling and fibroblast gap junctional coupling is someone's just going to throw you off the stage at that point. So there were a couple of uh, comments still from Tristan that says that uh, they've looked a bit in the F paper and saw changes in cleft width between left and right atria, but it's hard to tell for sure outside of disease states. And then Sai showed some differences between left and right guinea pig ventricles in at least one of his studies. It's a great question and one that's worth digging into. Right. And there is also a quick note on the optical mapping studies and regional heterogeneity. Those are all PACE studies, and we only study a limited region around the pacing site. So it's extremely difficult to tease out how regions of the heart ventricle might differ from each other. Thanks, Tristan, for all of Great. this. Yeah, thanks for clarifying all of those points. Uh, Enrique <laughs> has actually thrown sodium channels into fibroblasts, which was super interesting. Okay. All right. Uh, so can I, can I ask a quick question just on the, on this sort of ethaptic, um coupling? I, I mean, I'm familiar from the vascular side of vascular biology side of things that the, you know, the, the endothelial glycocalyx, which is basically like an, an ionic mesh, mm -hmm. um, sort of stores sodium. And there's this idea there that it somehow therefore protects the cells from sodium overload in some respects. Mm. But um, is there any, and I can imagine that if this was actually true, um, 
you know, that obviously would affect the aphaptic coupling quite substantially. So I don't actually know if there's evidence of these glycocalyx meshes on the outside of cardiac myocytes. Are there, to your knowledge, and, you know, do you think that they would affect the aphaptic coupling? If they're, if... Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm not 100, I'm not positive if that, if there is this glycocalyx in the, intercalated disc, um, you know, in, in that spacing between the cells. Um, but certainly, I mean, one thing that we've definitely talked about, and this actually is somewhat kind of relevant to, um, Jeff Sosterman's question about diffusion sort of in and out of the intercalated disc, right? I mean, if the spacing in these regions is on the order of nanometers, um, right. These are really tightly packed spaces. Right. And, you know, I'm honestly not sure about the glycocalyx. It's a, it's a great question. Um, but at a minimum, right, there's other proteins that are, you know, transmembrane proteins that are, you know, in, you know, jutting into this space. And so, you know, when you actually look at some of like the, you know, you know, EM images of what the intercalated discs look like, it's a very complex geometry. I mean, you know, even though, you know, our model includes more detail than most, it's still a simplification of a very complex geometry where these cells are forming these junctions. And so, you know, my suspicion is that diffusion sort of with both within and out of that region, because of, you know, the tight membranes and because of, you know, extracellular proteins that are in that space, right? It's, it's not just water, you know, solution that's diffusing, right? It's a, it's a very packed space is that I suspect that it's a very, complicated and slow process, right? I mean, and, you know, again, getting to kind of to Jeff's question of, you know, diffusion is probably really, really slow out of that space. Um, and so certainly how quickly that space refills and recovers and, you know, is coupled to the, the bulk are really key, you know, pieces for both, you know, these questions and then obviously other questions of conduction in general. Um, I think, I think the complex geometry is really important. Um, and again, it's a difficult question to study, but you know, that's kind of why we're building these models is to start to get a sense of how important are those properties even you know, as a prediction and then, you know, then getting into more complicated things like perturbing them experimentally. But it's a, it's a great question. And I, yes, I think it's involved and we're, we're, that's why we're trying to study it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we can wrap this up. I would like to thank again our speaker, Seth Weinberg, Thanks so much and everybody who participated in a very lively discussion, I must say. Thanks again, Davor, for hosting. Um, and I guess the next webinar is going to be in two days. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for the, the great questions. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.